Welcome to the Books of Titans podcast, where I seek truth in the world's best books. I'm your host, Eric Rostad, coming to you from the beautiful Books of Titans studio in Franklin, Tennessee. My goal is to read 52 books per year and share what I'm learning. I'll talk a bit about each book, tie ideas together from a variety of genres, and share the one thing I always hope to remember from each book. Today, I'm going to cover The Power Broker by Robert A. Caro with the tagline, Robert Moses and the Fall of New York. This is book 26 from my 2021 reading list. It's also the sixth and final book I've read by Robert Caro this year. That wasn't the plan, but after reading the LBJ series, I wanted to read everything else that Robert Caro had written. So this was the final and last book that I read by Robert Caro. It's a book about Robert Moses. I had never heard of Robert Moses before reading this book. However, I am familiar with his work, and I know that you are too. He was a developer, a master planner, and a master builder in the city of New York and in New York State. He built buildings, expressways, interstates, causeways, parkways, parks, playgrounds, dams, zoos, bridges, entire beaches, and entire towns. He's responsible for the Lincoln Center, Tavern on the Green, the United Nations Center, Riverside Park, the Queen's Zoo, oh, and about 127 other other major projects. Here's what he accomplished in just a short four-year time span. Here's Robert Carroll writing. When Moses had become president of the Long Island State Park Commission on April 18, 1924, there had been one state park on Long Island the almost worthless 200-acre tract on Fire Island. By the end of the summer of 1928, there were 14 parks totaling 9,700 acres. End quote. That's just in four years. And that was parks. How about highways? Here's what Kara says about highways. No one had dared laid superhighways through a heavily populated modern city on anything like such a scale. Lumped together all the superhighways in existence in all the cities on Earth, in 1945, and their mileage would not add up to as many miles as Robert Moses was planning in 1945 to build in one city, end quote. But we can't just even focus on parks and highways. We also need to recognize his work and the organization of the New York City government. Here's Robert Carroll writing later on. Most of Moses' achievements were highly visible achievements, monuments of concrete and steel, which may be expected to endure in the public consciousness for as long as they stand. But his achievement in reshaping the machinery by which New York State's millions of inhabitants are governed to make it substantially more responsive to the changing and growing needs of those millions is an episode all but lost to history. And it may be that this achievement is at least the equal of any of the others. End quote. Well, you don't develop an influence like this without an extremely high level of power. And you don't do it without having that power for an extremely long period of time, which Robert Moses had for 44 years. So yes, this is a book about Robert Moses. But more than that, at its heart, this is a book about the exploration of power, the accumulation of power, the use and the abuse of power, and ultimately the fall from that power. But here's the catch. It's not the type of power we're used to. Robert Caro says this in the introduction, The problem of constructing large-scale public works in a crowded urban setting, where such works impinge on the lives of or displace thousands of voters, is one which democracy has not yet solved. End quote. Because in a democracy, power is accumulated at the ballot box. Or so the author Robert Caro thought before researching this book, because Robert Moses was never elected to power. He was never voted in, and so he could never be voted out. In those 44 years, he had almost absolute power. And while the populace, the media, and others thought that the governor and the mayor were the source of power, Robert Moses actually had more power than the governor and the mayor. Well, how did he do this? How did Robert Moses gain power on April 23rd, 1934, and keep it until March 1st, 1968, while changing forever the city of New York, and really the idea of cities across the United States and the world? How did he do that? Well, that's what we find out about in this book, and it is a fascinating look into the unexpected nature of power. This book is huge. It's 1,162 pages. It took me 50 hours and five minutes to read it. That was between June 12th and July 8th of this year. That averaged about 43 pages per 
day. For all of Robert Caro's books, if I add all that time together, it took me 175 hours and 32 minutes over a 108-day period to get through all six of Robert Caro's books. I desired to read this book because it was written by Robert Caro. This is his very first book, and it came out in the 1970s. And having read them all now, the one thing I love about his books is that he can, he can paint this broad picture of history and give you the, the 30,000 foot level, but then he will take you down into someone's house and see what these, these shifts going on, these things happening at the 30,000 foot level, how they're affecting one family. And he did that again in, in this book. And that is something I really love about his books because you, you, you get that big picture, but you also see the ramifications at the personal level. So in the next segment of the episode, I'm going to dig in deeper into that top level versus, versus personal level in the area of means versus ends, a topic that Robert Carroll comes back to in, in nearly all of his books. What are the means that Robert Moses used to gain this power and to use this power and, and to develop and all that at kind of the top level? But then what did that, what did those means mean for people at the personal level? And what were the ends? And how do those things combine and, and, and connect? And then in segment three, I will close it as I do all my episodes with the one thing, my one key takeaway from the power broker. just a quick note, if you would like to support this podcast, you can do so by helping me purchase books for my 2022 reading list. Yes, I already have it chosen. I have the 52 books that I want to read next year, and it would help me out greatly if uh, if you would be interested in, in purchasing any of those. So I'm going to link in the show notes. I created an Amazon wish list, and you can go right there. It's the version that I'm that I, I would like to read, and uh, you can just go there and and purchase a book for me, and it'll be sent directly to me. Man, that would make me happy, and uh, that would really help out this project. And now back to the book. Well, in the introduction, Robert Caro asks. A quite provocative question. He asks this, would New York have been a better place to live if Robert Moses had never built anything? Would it have been a better city if the man who shaped it had never lived? And those were troubling questions, I guess. I mean, you come into the book, you know it's about Robert Moses, and the tagline of the book is Robert Moses and the Fall of New York. And so you're going into it with, with some sort of a trepidation of why, why are we talking about a fall of New York? This is a man who built extensively in New York. Didn't, didn't he make it better? D isn't, isn't all building, isn't all progress, isn't all growth better? I mean, look at the job creation, look at all the parks, look at the super highways and the bridges. Aren't, aren't these things better? Why, why are we bringing up questions like this of would it have been a better place if he had never lived? And to answer that, I think it, 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 you have to go back to something that Robert Caro brings up in, in nearly every single one of his books, and that's the question of means versus ends. And it's an, a very important question when you're dealing with and looking at these men who had an extraordinary amount of power. They had end goals in mind for what they wanted to accomplish. And so in, in looking at this book, Robert Moses wanted to accomplish certain things. And a lot of that was to build parks. And he said it would be for the people. And he said he was outside of politics and he was doing this for the people. And he wasn't bogged down with political uh, leanings and, and all that. And he was outside of that. Uh, but but his end goal was was parks and progress and building and development and highways. And so those were all good things, right? So any means to get to that end is okay because, well, the end goal, the end progress is good. The end, having somebody go to a park, a family being able to take advantage of a park that they didn't have before, well, that, that's a good thing. So these may be unlawful or devious or bad means to get to that end. Well, we can justify that because of these good things at the end. And so the book naturally goes into that discussion and, and it, it, it hovers over everything. So yes, this is 1,162 pages, but that line runs through so much of this book are the means that Robert Moses is using to get these 
things, these, these ends completed, is it worth it? Is New York City a better place today because of Robert Moses? Or when Robert Carroll wrote this book in, 19, in the 1970s, was it a better place because of what Robert Moses did? And it's an important question, and the overall structure of it being in means versus ends is also a very important question, because you've got so many different things that that went into that for Robert Moses. It ended up to where his desire for these ends actually became a means, a way for him to gain his own personal power. These ends also became a, a way for him to put forth prejudices that he had in himself, flaws that he had, and heavily in the areas area of, of racism. There are countless examples in this book of that. Uh, just a desire for poor people, African Americans, Puerto Ricans, to not go to the places that he was building, to where he would build these super highways to to areas of recreation, recreation, whether they were beaches or uh, parks. And he would make it so that anyone who had to ride a bus couldn't actually get there because the bridges that spanned over these super highways were 11 feet high and they needed to be 14 feet high for buses. So no buses, buses could travel on there. He didn't make space for mass transit. And so mass transit suffered through the 44 years that he was in power because he didn't he he cared about wealthy he cared about middle class but anything under that he did not want them in his parks in the things that he was building and there there are just example over after over example of of that in the in this book one of the the chapters in, in the last section i mentioned just i love how robert carroll can kind of take the thirty thousand foot level and, and get down to the to the nitty-gritty to the personal level uh, almost taking you into someone's house. There's one chapter called One Mile, and he highlights one mile of roads that that Robert Moses built through a neighborhood. He didn't have to build it through this neighborhood. It completely destroyed this community. He could have gone a few blocks away, and it wouldn't have, have impacted hardly anyone. It was a land that wasn't really being used. He could have done that. He didn't do it, but he did change it for rich people. If rich people said, "Hey, th- this is gonna this is gonna negatively impact us," uh, could you please move this road? He he would do it. But if if there was poor, if they did not have representation, if there were no lawyers that they knew, he just would go right through and displace all these people in the community. So you look at these these means to get to the to the end, uh, displacing thousands and thousands of people throughout throughout his life to to get to these specific ends. Was that was that worth it? And then you look at the ends themselves. So New York got a ton of parks, and that's a good end, right? Well, yes and and no. And and so for some of the parks that Robert Moses built, he had an idea of what a park should be, and his idea was that it was paved, uh, in the sense you could drive through it and and kind of leisurely drive through these parks. So the park to him wasn't just this expanse of green area. It was. It was a developed park, and it was playgrounds and and ballparks and things like that, which which are all good things. But his idea, you know, paving roads kind of through these parks was was different than a lot of other people's. But since he had the absolute power, his ends were what got through. But then you you take a step back in in these these parks that he built. He built 255 playgrounds in New York City during the 1930s, and only one of those playgrounds was in Harlem the African-American area. So 255 playgrounds, and there's one in Harlem. So there's no parks in areas with blacks and Puerto Ricans for decades. That's This is not just when Robert Moses has his power. This, this is for generations. And that's you can't get that back. He would, fi- he would build roadways, f- finish these, these huge roads with just tremendous expense, and he said it would alleviate traffic. And what would actually happen is there would be more traffic. So the road that already had traffic that was close to the new road that he built would still have the same amount or more traffic. And the new road, almost right after being built, would, would just be jam-packed with traffic. And he, he, he never really captured that 
almost this, if you build it, they will come that it's true with roads. And so if you build these roads, more people will move into the area. They'll, they'll go to where they can use the car to get to where they, they need to go. And, and then by not having, uh, space for mass transit and, uh, buses, it just made it so that traffic got worse. So yes, he's developing these huge roads and, and, and changing how people get around New York city, but it's not alleviating traffic at all. And then the ends ended up being higher taxes because uh, he would he would to get the project started. So the, this means versus ends of the end goal of 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 these projects that was the good thing. So if he lied a little bit or underestimated costs on purpose to get the project started and to get it going, well that was okay. But guess who guess who foot that bill? That was the taxpayer ultimately paying for this. He destroyed a lot of people in his in his path. So anyone confronting him about the means that he was using to get these ends could just have their career destroyed, their their reputation destroyed, and that happened quite often as well. So you 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 look at all these projects in whole, and and yes, it's it's impressive. He's probably he's probably built more than anyone in in history in terms of one man being responsible for for all this, but. That's an important question that Carol raises. Would it have been a better city if the man who had shaped it had never lived? This book came out while Robert Moses was still alive. And needless to say, he was not a fan of the book. Uh, Robert Carroll actually got to interview Robert Moses uh, a few times for this book. I think seven, if, if I recall correctly, seven times. And he brought up... Um, he all he did was bring up the name of a person associated with a bribe that Robert Moses took. He did not even insinuate there was a bribe or anything, but Robert Moses kind of saw where that questioning could have led, and that ended up being their last interview. And so um, Robert Moses was was aware of this book. He he knew it came out. It, 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 in comparison to, to LBJ, where uh, Robert Caro's books about LBJ have come out at, uh, since after Robert or after LBJ uh, was was passed away. So, looking at this question, looking at the means versus ends, it's it it's that age age old question: Can you use dishonest methods to gain supposedly good ends? And Robert Moses would have said yes. And he would have lamb blasted you for for your naiv- naivety in asking such a childish question. But what if the dishonest, shady means actually don't allow, uh, even allow for a good end? What if the bad tree can't actually produce good fruit? What if means are a directional litmus test? And if means used are leading in an evil way, then can the direction ever be good or right? If the direction of means, good or bad, determine the outcome, then we need to seriously reconsider how we look at power in those who occupy positions of power, whether they are elected or not. We also need to look at our own lives and and look at how we may be moving towards ends which we think are good and kind of allowing things to shift or slide or be shady on the mean side of it to get to the end that we think is good. If we if we look at it more from that directional point of view of if if we're using evil means or bad means or whatever word you want to use, is it even possible to get to a good end? It's a really good and deep question to think about, one that uh, if you spend those 108 days going through Robert Caro's books, you will be confront, confronted with that question over and over again. Now into segment three, and the one thing, my one key takeaway from The Power Broker. Well, I'm going to end this episode on a positive note and share something that I appreciated about Robert Moses. I know I kind of dogged him in the last segment about the means versus ends, but here's something I appreciated, and it it actually ties in quite well with how he was able to gain so much power. And it's this, whenever Robert Moses would propose a project to the governing authorities, he had every single detail worked out. Now he was he was bidding against other other people, and so everyone would at least come forward with a blueprint. But that's not where Robert Moses stopped. He had the blueprint, but after that he had the initial money required. 
and ready for payment. He had full crews ready to start the very next morning at dawn. He had a press release ready to give to all members of the new organizations, which they would gladly take almost verbatim and just reprint, including the New York Times. And he had all city ordinances covered, all requirements signed, everything ready to go. Now, let me ask you a question. If you're, if you're that person who is going to decide whether it is Robert Moses who gets this job or if it's the guy who just came up with a blueprint, who are you going to choose? Robert Moses is ready to go. He'll start tomorrow morning. This guy with a blueprint, he hasn't even thought through these other details. He doesn't know what city ordinances are required. He doesn't know he, his crew is not ready to start the next morning. Who are you going to choose? And, and I loved that about Robert Moses. You, you see this time and time throughout this book of, of how he, he would do that, how he would prepare for these, these projects and just have everything in order. And it was amazing to see, and it's something that I've even tried to do in my own work to just, I, I do a lot of putting proposals together for, for different jobs and, and how can I make mine stand out? How can I be ready to go the next day and, and make that clear? How can I have all T's crossed and I's dotted? What are ways that I can do that? And so it made me ask that, that question. Well, the overarching question still remains, the one that Carol introduces in the beginning of the book. Would it have been a better city? Would New York have been a better city if the man who had shaped it had never lived? Well, I hope you'll read this book someday and answer that question for yourself. If you live in New York, you have to read this book. You'll recognize so much of your current landscape and its origination with Robert Moses. If you're interested in urban planning, this is a must read. If you're interested in power and the pursuit of power, this is a must read. I'd like to share again a comment I received after reading Robert Caro's first book in, in, in recording that podcast. I had somebody contact me, and this was a 30-year veteran of journalism. They had, had studied journalism in school and then worked in, in media for, for 30 years. And this person said they learned more from Robert Caro's books about LBJ and Robert Moses. They learned more about politics and the media in those books than, than they did in all those years working, working in journalism and more than they learned in journalism school. This book is classic Carol, and you will learn about how things actually are, not not the sugar-coated presentation of how they should be or how things should work, but how they actually work. And just think back to to why Robert Carroll wrote this book. The the whole reason for starting to to and, and desiring to write this book is because he thought he knew how power worked. He thought he knew that power was generated at the ballot box and that you got that power by getting voted in. And here he comes across a man who who was never voted in and had near absolute power. How does that work? And Caro had to answer that question to write this enormous and powerful book. If you if you're like me, you will not come away jaded from this book though. I mean that there this this difficult discussion of means versus ends, seeing just devastating things happen to people and a- along the way of, of this quest of Robert Moses for all these projects. You don't come away jaded, though. You come away fascinated. Fascinated at how someone unelected could gain such power, such absolute power in a democracy. You'll, you, you can learn how to spot the person in, in any room, in any situation, who ha- actually has the power. And it may not be the person with the title. You'll learn what signs to look out for when someone is promising a utopian end that will require non-utopian means. And you'll learn about other ways to get things done on an extremely large scale. To recap, this book is a masterclass on power, what I started calling the perpetual pursuit of power. I keep coming back to that that subtitle, Robert Moses and the Fall of New York. Going into this book, you think, well, look look at all this that this man built. I mean, this is really incredible. If you just focus on how much this man built, you could could just think this is the greatest person that, that ever lived. But what if you dig deeper? What if you look at how those things got built? 
what was the cost to the people of New York at the time and even now? Would New York have been a better place if Robert Moses had never built anything or if he had never lived? This was an incredible book. I uh, I enjoyed the, the LBJ series a little better. This one, oh, so I'll put it this way. In, in the LBJ series, despite it being four books and taking me 120 total hours to read through those four books, I was not bored for a single one of those hours. There were about two to 300 pages in The Power Broker that I, that I thought could have been eliminated and, uh, and not a... It, it, it still would have been good. And and so I got bogged down for about two to 300 pages. I, I can't say that same thing about the LBJ series. Uh, but this was still an incredible book. And I I, I highly recommend it. Uh, anything by Robert Carroll. And, and I can't wait for the fifth book of the LBJ series to come out when Robert Carroll finishes that. Well, that's going to do it for this episode. Thank you for listening. I would love to hear from you. You can email me at Eric at booksoftitans.com. Let me know what you thought about this book, uh, especially if you've read this book and if you've read other books by Robert Caro. I'd love to hear from you, just what you thought of the book, the things that you got out of it, uh, your key takeaways. I, I One of the reasons I started this project was to connect to other people who are reading the same books. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can now help me purchase books for my 2022 reading list. I have a link in the show notes for my Amazon wish list. You can follow Books of Titans on Instagram or Twitter, and the website is stocked full of resources to help you find the best books and to create your own reading list. I'll be back in two weeks to discuss another book or series from my 2021 reading list. And until then, keep reading, keep learning, and keep listening. I'm out.